and it's my pleasure to introduce to this morning two of the giants of uh, Irish archaeology and of environmental studies. Our first speaker is uh, Mike, Mike Bailey, who is probably, uh, well not probably about it, he's done the greatest single, uh, made the greatest single contribution to uh, archaeology worldwide by establishing his own chronology. And it is uh, a huge pleasure for me and for all of us to be in the presence of, of such a giant. He has freed us as archaeologists, uh, I suppose I'm a part-time archaeologist, from the, from the uh, pursuit of typologies, uh, what I suppose what, what was archaeology was like before we had the, uh, the old chronology. And now we can do uh, more proper things, uh, things more proper to the archaeological pursuits, like uh, investigate into how people used to live in the past. And so I would, uh, I'm very happy to uh, introduce Mike Bailey, who's going to talk about digital chronology and early medieval settlement, uh, uh, the, the evidence from uh, the tree ring day. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much for the invitation to come and address you. Uh, I wasn't nervous till you mentioned giant. <laughs> Who's he talking about? Um, what I'm going to try to do is follow in the footsteps of the truly great Michael Conn, um, who uh, gave us a wonderful talk last night. And I'm going to try and do something very vaguely similar. I'm going to take you through a sort of a quasi-historical uh, set of uh, points which have occurred to me over the last um, several decades, uh, and, and all of the information actually delivered through the wonderful science of technology. And uh, uh, just put this in perspective, normally I go, when I'm giving a talk, I go and dig out a previous part and change a couple of things. Well, two nights ago I went, oh, I don't want to hear about myths or comets. So, whoops, so I had to go and uh, cobble together something. And uh, that's what you're about to hear about. So, <clears throat> uh, an underlying theme of this talk is going to be just how little we know about uh, what has gone on in the past. Um, but uh, you could see it very much in, in my talk last night that as more and more information is put together, pictures are beginning to solidify themselves, beginning to see where the real problems are. Uh, what also became very clear to me listening was that when I was doing a lot of the, the formative work, I was the first person to have any of these dates. And of course, I didn't know what to do with them, so I just said what I thought and, and got myself into lots of, lots of bother. So I'm going to take you back, uh, basically through the last two millennia, just looking at a series of issues which are scattered broadcast through a couple of hundred publications. If I had my career over again, I wouldn't publish in 50,000 conference proceedings, well it feels like 50,000, um, because nobody can ever find them. I, I would try and publish always in the peer review literature. Uh, that didn't seem to matter because there's a mixture of, of, of popular and, and peer review in my CV, so it didn't, it didn't hold me back. But it means actually getting access to the information means you have to really poke around a lot. Although I have tried to remedy that by, by consolidating stuff into, into texts and in books. So <clears throat> this is the sort of thing that I've been up against uh, right from uh, comparatively early days. And I should say that although Irish general chronology is an important uh, stone in the wall of, of world chronology, you've got to remember that there are lots of other dental chronologists out there. And the great joy of dental chronology is you can compare between chronologies from, from here to Germany, to Scandinavia, to Siberia, to North America, even South America, and occasionally down to the antipodes, <coughs> all in precise time control, which of course is something that didn't exist before uh, really the last few decades. Well, then you've got <coughs> access to, say, eight European chronologies, and you simply plot out the mean chronology uh, by averaging all together. You see interesting things like this typical <coughs> annual jagged cycles, uh, ma major downturns, and really, really strange things like this. A dramatic increase in oak growth right across Europe from Ireland to Poland, uh, somewhere between 1816 and about 1834. Um, <clears throat> and you ask yourself, what was that? And you test to see, uh, well, maybe this is the direct result of huge numbers of oak stained planters to build the navies of the future. 
but you can control for that by taking long-lived trees that grew across the whole of this period, and they also show this rise. So there was some environmental factor, and <coughs> there, whatever that is, uh, 100, uh, 190 years ago, um, that uh, we don't understand. Why, why did oaks do that? Was there some dramatic change in water table right across Europe, or was there, was there a temperature increase, or what was it? And I don't know the answer. So my job has always been to simply say, look, guys, there's something interesting there, and hope that somebody else eventually stumbles on something that will give us the answer. 1740 was an exact case in point, because I knew nothing about it, but I had observed it in the trees. <coughs> and I was giving a talk in front of a, of a group of Bruce Campbell's um, students in Belfast. Uh, he's a medieval historian interested principally in the 14th century. But he uh, simply said, oh, you mean you've never heard of the last great um, uh, demographic crisis of the pre-industrial revolution, and I went, no, I haven't heard of that. Um, <laughs> and apparently, in the early 1840s, because it was so cold that it froze the potatoes in the ground, you had a famine, effectively every bit as bad as the more famous 1840s famine in Ireland, and it's estimated that that event killed 300,000 people. And that started to get elective, which said something along the lines of when trees suffer, humans suffer. Um, because that's what we <coughs> need. So, there are no answers in any of that, just uh, pointers that somebody's got to go and, and do the work and find out what's happening. Now, I don't know whether you can see this clearly enough, but uh, when, you've, when you've started doing that sort of thing, you realise, I'm a lumper. I, I say, let's add everything together and see what the big picture is. Whereas a lot of people in this world are splitters. Let's go down to the leaf and have a look at the cells inside the leaf of this one leaf on this one tree, <coughs> this one tree. Well, that's never going to take anything in my view. So I take eight chronologies from all over the world, obviously missing out the, the equatorial bits, <coughs> average them together, and you then notice that if you smooth that data, you see these long, massive cycles coming up through centuries back here, from 1400 up to 1600. And quite suddenly, global tree rings go into a short-term pattern, which starts to break down, but doesn't really change back to anything like this earlier pattern until you get to 1740. Now, I look at that and I go, well, we know 1600 was a big dust veil event, widely recorded, and it looks as though, to me, that the Earth climate system went from one mode, click, into another mode, and it then took until 1740, and whatever it calls 1740, because of course we don't know, you can play around with volcanoes or impacts from space or uh, statistically unlikely climate anomalies. Um, but whatever was happened there seems to have flipped the system into another mode. Now Bruce Campbell, who looked at this, said the interesting thing about that is this mode is not actually the same as this mode. In other words, the system changes but it changes into a different mode each time. That has frightening implications for anyone trying to calibrate climate against anything up here and working on back. Because of course, if the system has shifted, the calibration won't work. So whoever designed the Earth system um, that made it as difficult as possible to see in detail into the past. I kind of like that. Quasi mystical. <coughs> and uh, there, here's a sort of terrible diagram that we uh, found it in the way, pushing some things together. Um, basically, this is the sort of stuff you can do when you've got lots of time series. The red curve is instrumental cent cent central England temperature smooth. So you're just simply taking the list of dates, uh, done five point smoothing routine on it, and plotted it against uh, uh, large scale. Um, a uh, uh, tree ring response from around the world. Now, I don't know whether you can see it, but inside the box, the two red and blue lines are remarkably similar. And you're left saying, oh, world trees were responding to temperature from mm, around about 1740 or 1750 up until about 1940. And uh, <coughs> before that, it's chaos, and after that, it's chaos. Well, what does that mean? Well, it could mean that the, uh, the, the instrumental records are bad back here and people are still fiddling around with the sort of thermometers and what have you. But it could, of course, also mean that the system was different back there 
until it flipped into that bit of the system where everything is in, under some sort of control. And then you get this 1940, this is all being picked up by the likes of Keith Griffith, the climatic research unit. <coughs> you flip into a different state. And as he says, basically trees have stopped paying any attention for the last 40 or 50 years because we've given them enough temperature and enough CO2, they're quite happy. Um, whether we're going to be happy is a whole different, uh, whole different scenario. So <coughs> you can play around with these things. So either the instrumental records weren't as good or the system was different and some really good limiting possibilities after 1940. And uh, there's my cautionary tale. When you try to reconstruct what happened in the past, it may be extraordinarily difficult to do. So, um, suggest when you look back in time, you didn't guarantee the system respond the way it seems to respond today. It may have been a lot more volatile, capable of jumping from one state to another. Uh, what is the next? Yeah. Ah, yes. Um, and of course, that's now the situation as a species on a planet that we find ourselves in. Because um, <coughs> global warming appears to, if you believe the climate skeptics and others, uh, appears to have paused for the last 10 years. The problem is if you go and look at some work by James Lovelock, that's almost exactly what you would expect before a state change, when you might suddenly go, uh, like you could go five degrees cooler, or you could go five degrees warmer, in which case next year's meetings would be very confusing. <laughs> um, so, <coughs> we are playing the most amazing game uh, with the planet, and we're relying almost entirely on luck. And from a species level point of view, that's, that's really the way to proceed. Anyway, that, that, that's the sermon over for this morning. Now I'm going to delve back into the past and show you a few examples of, you know, just things that have come to my attention which I thought were interesting, and in some cases seem to be borne out. And uh, it, it certainly on other implications would see it. Try and make them a bit settlement oriented. Um, <coughs> this is an extremely ancient slide uh, because it was from the formative days of uh, building chronologies in Ireland and Britain. And uh, we had a problem getting across 1350, and it didn't take long, of course, to discover that uh, if I was right, drawing it today, I would say 1348. The conventional wisdom was 1349 at that stage. <coughs> we arrived with the Black Death. So we had lots of timber being felled up to the middle of the 14th century and lots of trees growing from the middle of the uh, 14th century. And of course, I simplify things down to um, uh, lots of people died and there was no need to build any houses for a long time. And we see very similar things in, in Europe. Now, <coughs> we now have, all these years later, dated very large numbers of timbers uh, from all periods, and um, all that work, by the way, I should say, has been largely due to David Brown uh, in Belfast, who is the practicing dendrochronologist. Uh, I gave up acting measuring tree rings uh, about 30 years ago, uh, but I got more interested in playing with the data. <coughs> if we plot the end dates of trees from Ireland, so this is just from the whole island, you see there's a scatter of dates up uh, to there's 1340, there's 1350. Then we haven't got any felling dates uh, basically until you get to the last decade of the 14th century. But those are start dates which are these. <coughs> um, this is sort of rag bags, random start dates, paralleling the felling dates, which is what you'd expect in a normal situation. Uh, and then from 1350, we start to see lots of trees uh, uh, starting to grow. And of course, I had always said the trees started for when we did after 1350. Well, actually, when you plot this, you can see that's not strictly true. The real increase in the uh, start year, years of trees, which are then growing on for the next several centuries, uh, is actually around 1380. So something happened around 1380 um, that, that, again, either, either, well, either it was the acorns from the first of these regenerating oaks that gave rise to this population, <coughs> or it was something uh, again, affecting humans and forestry management and, and what have you. And uh, again, that's stuff for somebody else to work that out. As I said, you could see exactly the same pause in Germany. This was part of Holstein's uh, lifetime compilation of dendro gates, running up to 1347, and then new buildings came to his attention 
in Germany until 1425, so a nice 70 year building pause when you lose a third of your population, I suppose that's what, that's what happened. <coughs> now, to me, the logic would be if we can see the Black Death that clearly in triggering dates, um, it probably will help us uh, having a first order <coughs> interpretation of earlier events that show up in the treatment. So that's in a sense what one should be looking for to do with human population levels, which must of course have some implication for settlement. Um, <coughs> as most of you know, I have dined out uh, for the last 25 years uh, on the 540 event. Um, it became clear very quickly uh, if you look at European oaks, and you can see this two stage downturn there's 536 of recovery and 37 to 38, and then a really big drop into 540. So I've always called it the 540 event, but most other scientists refer to it as the 536 event. But you can see why I am more interested in that than in that. And uh, <coughs> uh, for a long time, the ice core evidence. Uh, suggested there was no big volcano in this vicinity, and hence I went down the commentary scenario uh, line of thinking. So, instead of a quick look through, uh, you can see the event is clear as day at Irish Oaks or Finnish Pines. You can see it in <coughs> North and in South America. Dropping those in South America, this chronology barely detects 536, but really, really, really says what happens immediately after 540. Um, always remember the trees in the Southern Hemisphere are growing six months out of phase with the trees in the Northern Hemisphere. So they have to allow for that if you're doing any detailed work. <coughs> and uh, Griffith, who originally didn't believe in the 540 event, um, then discovered that it was there in this massive uh, temperature sensitive chronology complex that spreads from Siberia to Sweden there. 536 uh, followed by site recovery and then they drop into the year 540. So in that particular case, uh, they do see 536 as being a more extreme event. So there you've got an interesting juxtaposition of two uh, severe events. And the question there is, is it all caused by one vector or is it caused by a multiple uh, concern of some kind? I'm oh, sorry, that's just uh, uh, their, their ego's uh, Mongolian chronology, which subsequently turned up, and there's 536, and there's 540, 41, 42. You know, prime. This is this is a event that does require adequate explanation. Uh, so I spent uh, decades almost uh, playing around with <coughs> could we make a, a comet scenario, an impact scenario, stand up, and um, uh, that currently, as you can bottom in mind there, it looks as if. It's what kind of jury still out, and hopefully the, the next couple of slides will give you some detail on that. The problem that I see in a lot of science is people go for the simple solution. They go for the solution they want. Um, my attitude is what we what we really want is the right solution. You just have to wait until the evidence comes forth. So this is what happened between 2008 and the present time. Um, there were pre-existing acid layers in, uh, in the Dithrian grip cores, these are the Danish ice cores. Um, you can see 515, 529, 533.5, and the other one. Um, <coughs> and I've noticed that bristlecone pines of frost rings, which workers in America have suggested are due to climate downturns during the growing season caused by uh, big explosive volcanoes. And they have them at about 22, 31 particular. And you can see quite clearly that there's a tendency for there to be a seven year offset between the ice core dates and the frost ring dates. And the frost rings, of course, are in tree rings, so they're precisely dated. Uh, and therefore, someone like me ends up taking on the ice core workers and saying, looks to me, guys like you <coughs> have to uh, start thinking of moving your ice core chronology. Uh, which does not, I can tell you, go down very well. <laughs> so, I'm getting up and back really for the Viking raids. So, what I've done here is I've taken Hackenbrood's uh, Swedish temperature sensitive record, that's this jagged curve here. Um, here are the raw Larsen ice dates from 2008, the little circle. There are no ages at all to so these big downturns. I've plotted cross rings, which do relate very closely to the uh, Swedish uh, 
to bring down in terms. And then I've um, <coughs> pointed out here that Larson, in fact, moved the dates slightly, we were willing to move them a couple of years, in order to make this second volcano fit to um, the, uh, the, the 536 event. And indeed, if you go and read Larson et al. Uh, 2008, they actually say that this is a massive, previously underestimated, uh, an exceptionally large volcano, which makes you wonder how they missed it the first time when they were doing their analyses, uh, and that it caused the whole 15 years of events from 536 to 545. And you think, now oh, hold on a minute, there's all that stuff of the two phase nature and the tree rings all over the place. You can't just have one event necessarily causing all that. The problem is, the general scientific community around the world have just gone, oh, that's it, that's fine. Uh, Larson et al. have proven that the whole thing is volcanic. And you're almost left going, is this because we want to airbrush any other possibilities out of the record? I mean, is there a, is there a dead hand there somewhere trying to distort reality? Because the reality is, <coughs> in 2008, I replied to Larson's paper pointing this exact diagram out and saying that if you move the ice gate seven years, you can explain the double downturn with two of their volcanoes. That would be down here, they would be here. And it would also fit to that one and to that one. That paper has been airbrushed out of history, though it's in the same journal as the Larson paper. You know, thinking, why don't they want to face up to that? Because it would involve moving the ice for seven years, which the ice core workers will not countenance. So, we have interesting political science aspects going on, and the one thing which is obscured is the truth. Notice. So, um, <coughs> and why do I go on about 540? Well, just here's one random tree from an archaeological site, and you can see that you couldn't even pick out 536. 538 is a wide ring, 536 is a ring which isn't distinguished from any other, but after 540, you go into no summer growth for about a decade. And a lot of the trees actually showed physical damage at the time. So I, I want to know what happened at 540. I don't actually care what happened at 536. So I'm biased because I don't understand. Um, <coughs> so as I've just said, 540 issue is settled if you sort of read the literature. But it's not settled until the Danes actually admit that their chronology has to move. Because you see, while the Danes maintain their chronology, Then <coughs> you have this second event, which has no explanation. And if it's got no explanation, then it's virtually certainly, if you go by the mythology, an extraterrestrial event. Which of course is actually the secret as to why people want to airbrush it out. Because governments can't do anything about it. impacts on space and they don't even want to think. <coughs> so, anyway, uh, this is this is the this is the sort of nonsense you get up to, or can get up to. So there you are, it's a big issue. Um, uh, remember, it, it, you lost about a third of the world's population, quite possibly, in this event. Not something to be taken lightly. You have the Justinian plague, and whatever var variant of it arrived up as far as Ireland and elsewhere. Um, was it due to a comet, rather than a volcano near 1500 years ago? Uh, I would genuinely want to know the answer to that. And it appears that out there in the real world, most people don't want to know the answer. So I find it intriguingly interesting. Uh, and here's some of the other sort of information that turns up. Um, Hubert Leuschner, uh, this is his diagram from uh, Göttingen, and he has got loads and loads and loads of dated trees. <coughs> and he points out that at 540 in Germany, they see quite a major regeneration. So that's the sort of information that you can then add in to the sort of information Michael was uh, showing us, <coughs> where you can see changes in what's happening in the various pollen records. And if you start to put them all together, you can probably <coughs> begin to tease out a picture that the effects of 540 really were felt very widely uh, in, in a whole variety of different ways. But strangely, the way we seem to see it in Europe and in uh, America is that <coughs> in, this is in south south west the United States where they've got large number of dental dates for uh, uh, desert dwellings. Um, what they see are very few sites as we see here and, and in Europe 
until you get to 540, and immediately after 540, you get large numbers of sites. So the reaction seems to be quite positive. Even we would think the reaction to a major downturn would be negative. It seems that human population maybe bounces back rather quickly. It maybe frees up the opportunities. You get better gene mixing. You get who knows what you get. Uh, but uh, fascinating that you should see such an exactly synchronous uh, event in, in two widely separated areas. And uh, <coughs> uh, historians hate this sort of stuff because, of course, if you go back to uh, ecclesiastical history of Ireland uh, in, in, from 1840, modern scholarship would go, you can't believe any of that stuff. You know, we would need absolute proof of the dates of these foundations through archaeological excavation and dating and blah, blah, blah. All I'm saying is, it is interesting that if you went to the 19th century and asked the church what it did think of foundation dates of ecclesiastical establishments, they see a trickle of them from, oh yeah, of course, here's uh, roughly 450, which is Patrick uh, arriving and starting to do things. A trickle of them through until, yes, 540, and then combine nearly everybody's foundation happened to be after 540. So the church. The church actually had recognized 540 uh, uh, nearly two centuries ago and maybe had been carrying that idea down with them for a very long time. I, of course, take that to its logical conclusion, which is that if, and there certainly were comets visible around 540, whether they actually caused the effects on the ground or other matter, um, it's not impossible that what happened at 540 with its, its effective in testing uh, punishing God aspect uh, that everybody went from well we're sort of toying around with taking on Christianity to yep we're all saved <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, nothing like a big visitation in the sky to sort that one out <laughs> um, <coughs> so you can see my problem is I just cut to the chase I, I, I don't mess around with how do we produce a reasoned argument? I just say, well, there's the answer. No, no one proved me wrong. Uh, and people love trying to do this. And in fact, sometimes it's um, So this is another one to do these sort of sort of settlement issues, which again is contentious. Uh, back in the 1980s, Jim Mallard Mallard and I published this in, in, uh, in Imania. Uh, you have quite a lot of denigrated sites. I mean, remarkably consistent given that these are just coming from all over Ireland. Uh, <coughs> you, you, you wonder how you could get such, on a random sampling basis, get such a clear picture and then such a clear gap from basically 648 um, to uh, 720. And then the, the sites take up again. So the use of oak, specialised in all as that is, uh, does show a very clear gap here. Of course, being me, as you now understand, I go, oh, there's a plague that sort that out, yes. and, and leave a smoking gun for somebody else to play with. And in the same article, we published this, which is, again, the 720 start of activity again. We didn't actually have all that many dates. The picture was pretty clear. But they run up to about 9.30, and then there's a century to 9.30 to 10.30 with new sites, including particularly the demise of horizontal mills, which we have an enormous number. Um, <coughs> and I even played around with the idea, if you look at the start dates, you can actually see there's a missing generation of trees, um, because there are no trees starting between 7 and 8 on the road, and no trees ending between 9.30 and 10.30. No missing generation, I sort of like that idea. Um, <coughs> and I forget where Paul Stein saw the same gap, but that's not really relevant. Uh, and then I tried playing around with various aspects of those two gaps, pointing out where the mill, the great bulk of the mills seem to come at around 800, they seem to stop at about 930. Um, notice that there are new building gaps or problems in building European chronologies. And you look at that and you try and add in a bit of this sort of wet dry stuff from bog studies. Uh, and you, you think you can produce a, a simplistic scenario of the mills are relating to maybe a dry phase. Well, if you talk to Mick Monk now uh, about his uh, <coughs> corn drying kilns and the mills and the information just coming out of the wetness and dryness indices that are now being done, it's much, much more complicated than that. But of course, this is only a first look to uh, wet people's appetites and annoy them enough that they go and try and do some work to <coughs> ensure that it must be different from that. 
Um, <coughs> so, as time has gone on and more and more sites have been dated, it is interesting to follow an accumulated diagram for years 300 to 1100 AD, but there are no sites at all between 50 BC and about 300 AD that have come up to produce data, uh, oak dates. Uh, there's a trickle of sites until you get to 540, and lots of sites, there's a gap still there uh, between 6650 and 720. And lots of sites, are, notice you begin to see points of inflection, which are probably significant. There's some changes in the rate of construction of things. And there's a gap up there between you know, 930 and 1030. Uh, <coughs> you might say, oh, well, you're now getting sites in these gaps. These are actually estimated filling dates, so it's not impossible. In fact, that timber actually relates to somewhere up here. And same with this. And there's, there's still no positive filling dates in, in those uh, two gaps. And then this was fairly mind-blowing uh, because uh, what David did was he took the original uh, dates from uh, Gillian and Mallory, 1988, and then he added in all the dates he had produced since. And you can see them running down to uh, the two basic 930 still, and then the gap is now as good as 1010, and then sites take up on the other side of the gap. So these are two totally independent sets of data, courtesy of archaeologists thrashing about in the ground throughout Ireland for decades, and they've singularly failed to find any data of timbers from that gap, which is sort of intriguing. Now, <coughs> You do have to step back from that and say, remember, it relates only to oaks. We don't know what was happening with other species. Uh, it relates only to oaks that are long-lived enough to be dateable. So in other words, we don't even know what young oaks were doing. We just know that mature oaks are missing from the record. Nobody was, if they were filling them, they weren't putting them into context or it survived for our villages to dig them up. Uh, so we're missing all sorts of other information. Uh, but <coughs> Um, people may not have had access to oak timbers for various reasons. So that's another scenario. Maybe it was a legal thing. Maybe, maybe the people in charge had said, no, you cannot have oak timbers. We don't care what you say, you're not getting them. And if you can't get big oak timbers, you probably can't build horizontal mills, and it could be that sort of issue. Um, as I said, the bottom yard is a bit extreme and say, well, it looks to me, when I see that diagram, there was nobody here. <laughs> um, and I was trying to explain to people in the bar last night uh, with musical accompaniment. <laughs> but um, I work in a very simple scenario. And if you don't know what that scenario is, you may, be, you may misinterpret all of what I say. I look at limiting cases. The limiting case is not going to necessarily be right. But <laughs> in a case like this, the limiting case is that there was nobody on the island to build anything. Now, <coughs> uh, as a living case, I don't expect that to be correct, but you may well find there are less people. In other words, there's a tendency towards that limiting case. Because uh, the other limiting case is there was absolute normality, and you know, well, it certainly wasn't absolutely normal, because this appears to be normal. That's not normal. And so you, you, you know what the limiting cases are, and then you say, well, is the, is the true answer tending to one extreme or to the other? And sorry, that's what I've always been doing. I forgot to tell people that's what I was doing. Do I just think I'm an extremist? That would come from another land that probably goes with the territory. So, my attitude is that, yeah, the other thing is, I did this the other night. I finished it at quarter to 11. I haven't about it since. So, it's some of it's a surprise to me. My attitude is that Denny Date should be an independent. So, yeah, that's, that's another issue that I think is worth addressing. Uh, <coughs> you see, it's not actually up to me to go out there and do the archaeology and find historical data and all the rest of it. Because I'm a biased observer, I know that. I will try and find the evidence which will bolster my crazy ideas. So it's actually very important that the dendro just remains completely independent. People like me going, oh, it looks interesting. I think that's worth looking at. Uh, and being as annoying as possible to force people to react and, and to go on the and that's what we're now seeing, as the picture is piled right, not necessarily entirely because of me, but um, it would be nice if it were, but it, it's just that as things progress, as much more widespread dating is going on, more and more sites are coming to we are starting to see the pictures emerge. 
my problem was that I was in before there was a picture, uh, and the uh, pencil was just flashing about it in the dark. Um, <coughs> so let's go back to the, oh yes, that diagram again. See, one of the, one of the issues um, <coughs> is the, why on earth do we not find any oak timbers uh, from 50 BC through to 300 AD? And we, if you actually think about it, we find damn few timbers from 50 BC through to 500 AD. What on earth were people doing? Now, obviously, I default to there was nobody here, which upsets really quite a lot of people, because, of course, we're seeing evidence for cereal cultivations, we're seeing the arrival of technologies uh, a bit later on for, for milling, and we're seeing uh, corn drying technology. We're beginning to see the, the pattern uh, broadening out. We're beginning to see uh, sites pushing back uh, to this by 40 bit rats, which we thought was going up here, but they're beginning to maybe push back that bit further. So the picture is gradually consolidating. But you still do have a problem with why there's so little material. And it's widespread because uh, uh, Anna uh, Brindley and, and Jan Lamping <coughs> did a lot of radio carbon dates years ago on dugout boats, which are a quasi random thing. Um, and they, they found no dugouts give radio carbon dates which calibrate between 6 and 800, which is very much like that uh, 650, 700 gap that we have in the tree rings, and only one dugout uh, dates between uh, 1630 BP and 2060 BP, which means that there's only one between 100 BC and 500 AD. So you can be forgiven thinking there weren't many people about in Ireland. If they were, they weren't doing much. Um, and it does, it does require some sort of explanation. I haven't bothered to put in here uh, something out paper I put into Barry Rafferty's fish rift, which was that uh, it looks to me like the event at 44 BC, because the ice core workers probably haven't got their dates right, it has drawn attention away from what happened in 44 BC. The Chinese records and some of the European records are pretty explicit that it was very, very bad indeed. And it shows up very widely in tree rings as a very severe event. It's not impossible that there actually was a real uh, downturn, uh, not just environmentally, but in the numbers of people on this island, and that we took a real hit around uh, 44 BC and in the few years thereafter, and that that's been obscured by faulty chronology. So the chronology is everything. If you don't know when stuff happens, it's very hard to make sense. That's really so that's, that's why I'm there. Yeah. So <coughs> here's another accumulated uh, picture, just to show that we, we should be aware of uh, things going on. In uh, Northern Ireland, we were able to build chronology back in 915 AD, and the, the Dark Age chronology, which we call it the Dark Age chronology, the early Christian, the Iron Age, early Christian chronology runs up to uh, 894, and we have lots of uh, fun attempting to bridge across that gap. Um, and in fact, we ended up using English material to, to form the bridge. But there's exactly the same gap in the Swedish Hines. And you've got in China, the end of the Tang Dynasty is just this time, and the final uh, collapse is just at this time. And this is a, an oxygen uh, record from North Grip, uh, which again suggests some sort of real uh, downturn temperature and real downturn at around that time. And you're like, hmm, that's sort of interesting. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Uh, <coughs> maybe sometimes we begin to see changes in, in, in patterns in Ireland which are not that dissimilar to what's going on in the rest of the world. I mean, you can internationalize some of these issues. Uh, once you've got the dates, you can begin, begin to see hints of, of, of pattern. And uh, uh, this is in the Deer Park Farms report, which has just come out fairly recently. Um, <coughs> and in this, I've just called it English Oak against Irish Oak. And they're doing unbelievably similar things most of the time until you get up to about 880, and you suddenly see quite dramatic opposite behaviour in the, in the chronology, and then they go back to doing pretty much the same thing. And I think, how do you get trees on opposite sides of the RSC to do opposite things? I mean, what, what's the physical parameter here? <coughs> it's an incredible systems of blocking, bringing uh, England into, into um, a more European sphere and leaving us out in the ocean. 
uh, or what is it? Does it affect wind patterns? Does it affect the way you can dry your corn? And some of these McMunks in the equation again, what, asking questions about can you see difference between the east and west of Ireland? If you get a regime that suddenly does something that's maybe hinted at there, uh, maybe it becomes intolerably wet in one part of Ireland or another. And it's, it's, I don't know the answer to it. No, I don't know the answer. Uh, but it, it, the triggering certainly posed an interesting question. So that is truly a yeah. That's truly a normal behavior. And of course, when you come up to this <coughs> uh, 900, yeah, there, there's 930. Uh, and there she receives another start of uh, regenerative trees in Germany. You're definitely, hmm, just how severe was that sort of package of things going on between 900 and 930? Uh, and the answer is, well, that's what we need to know, that's our job. Um, <coughs> now, Dave and I were writing a paper for something else, and we said to ourselves, in the course of building the Irish chronology, we, we ran into several difficult problems. For example, I've just shown you that we have to use English material to bridge across uh, the, the 9th century. And uh, I also showed you that there was a missing generation of oaks in Ireland between 700 to 800 and between 900 to 1,000. That missing generation, I think. Right. Well, <coughs> here was the problem we had. We, we had the Irish early Christian chronology running up to 894, and you had Northern Ireland plus the Dublin and the technology running back to 855. And that overlap was only 40 years, so we couldn't use that to, to build a chronology. And that's why we had to use English material to bridge across it. In the intervening time, one batch of timbers turned up. And they're the timbers from the Ross Kill the Viking ship, which are currently in the museum in Ross Kill. <coughs> and they uh, ring patterns run from 778. Night between 700 and 800, and they end up at uh, 1018. So there are the missing generation of Irish timbers. The Vikings took them all and took them away. And when you get some of them back, lo and behold, they bridge the gap. Now, I think that's unbelievably, almost uncanny, that one could identify from the tree rings that there was a missing generation. And here's an example of it. And where is it? It's in the bottom of a Danish fjord. And you got it. I mean, you come on, you can't explore around for claws there. <laughs> so, um, you see why I love this stuff. I mean, you wind people up endlessly. Um, when it comes to the ADC uh, join, again, we had to go, uh, <coughs> so we had uh, Irish or Christian material, and that in the, in the meantime, it used to run back to 13 BC and it now runs back to 50 BC and it used to run back, I'm sorry, run down to 95 BC and now it runs down to 69 BC. So we still have an Irish cap. And of course we had to use English Roman material from Carlisle and London to the bridge across that gap. <coughs> and um, uh, even with the best will in the world, if you do allow an extension of the boundary and uh, the site chronology, uh, it's only one tree, and the, we can't we can't get a link with that tree. So we still couldn't build an Irish chronology across the AD BC transition, even to this day. And we still have to rely on English Roman material, and that's just the way it is. It's sort of sort of a tree you see. And uh, <coughs> yeah, that's just a, a revised version of the same diagram. So <coughs> climate related if time permits. One minute, no, no. One, one minute. Um, well, okay, this again just comes out of that. Uh, you know what I was talking about from 6.50 to 7.20, there seems to be a pause in the building. Well, in, in looking at um, uh, tree ring indices uh, across this period from 4.50 to 1050 AD, uh, you, you can see by eyeballing it, you don't need to do any clever mathematics. You can see that from just after 650, it goes into a clear cyclic behavior of that sort of model down here, which is what it's doing. Uh, it wasn't doing that period before. It is doing it for that period, and then it's going to be doing something else. So it's just another version 
if you go and start looking at this stuff in detail, of that whole business that I showed you, the global things changing around 1600 and changing around 1740. The system is quite capable of shifting mode, and of course the poor people on the ground trying to practice their arable and pastoral economies can suddenly go from, well everything was working well up to here, granddad, and then Oops, it all seems to have gone badly wrong, and then maybe later on it changes back into a different, more acceptable mode. And basically, we need to map these out in as much detail as possible and put them out so that you know what the target is. Because these, these are fixed in time, uh, and that's the framework which you can then fit all your other palynological settlement related archaeological evidence to. Uh, so that's as much settlement as you're getting. Thank <laughs> you.